So my name's uh, Fahad, and I'd like to talk to you about the parts of Parkinson's which aren't the motor symptoms. Parkinson's, as I'm sure you're all very aware, is more than just a tremor. So what I'm going to be describing is what we refer to as the non-motor symptoms. And these are hugely varied, and they cause everything from uh, fatigue, uh, loss of motivation, a level of apathy. I've just got couple of features of depression, constipation, REM sleep behaviour disorder, as Harry was talking to, to even things like um, problems with impulsivity, people with um, problems gambling, buying too much, binge eating. So there's really quite a huge number of things that Parkinson's can actually cause. But despite this, there seems to have been, um, in recent times, um, well, recently we've actually come much better at looking at these, but historically there's always been this focus on the motor symptoms. And these other symptoms, despite potentially affecting people's quality of life, tend to be underreported. I mean, this work itself is based on uh, Michelle's work back in Milton Keynes, which she alluded to earlier, where two thirds of these symptoms are not actually reported in the clinic. So that's a, that's a huge um, discrepancy there. And there are many reasons why they may not actually be reported. I mean, clinics are busy. You come in for the patient to be assessed. We have a look at a few tests looking at the various motor functions. Your medications are titrated accordingly. People may not think that these symptoms are related to Parkinson's because as I say, having a loss of motivation, people may not think, well, is this immediately something to do with the Parkinson's? Some of them may be embarrassing. As I say, there's huge variation, everything from um, sexual dysfunction to depression. Some things may be things that people don't want to talk about and curiously enough, the, the younger patients tend to underreport more than the older patients, the reasons for which aren't, aren't entirely clear. But when I say historically that there has been this um, mismatch between what people are experiencing, I mean, even in the earlier, so um, Harry actually uh, alluded to some of this earlier, James Parkinson, when he did do his original descriptions, did actually mention the fact that there's problems with constipation, the fact that people would have salivary symptoms, creating too much dribbling, drooling, that kind of thing. And even the next person who actually coined um, the term Parkinson's, Schalke, was referring to problems particularly with pain, which we now know is quite a common feature of Parkinson's. And also that things like memory might be affected. So I'd like to take this opportunity, and I have to say I, I appreciate it sort of uh, later on in the afternoon, just to feed back the fact that we, we are collecting a lot of data here, and this is um, due to the kind and generous contributions of yourself, and it does take time but we are looking at this, and I would just like to feed back some of the results that we are finding in the clinical aspects, so some of the non-motor symptoms, and what they mean for the purpose of research and driving things forward. So the questions I'd like to go through today are these symptoms that I'm talking about. Do they affect people? Are they common? Do, do they matter? Are they actually affecting people's quality of life? Are we, as clinicians, picking them up? Are we treating them appropriately? And then also, with slight reference to what Harry's been talking about, can we actually predict the Parkinson's before the motor symptoms start? And can we use it to unpick the various different forms of Parkinson's? So, to start with, are they common? So, looking at discovery cohort, so this is taking from results where um, we did the download of data a few months ago, and we included the large numbers of patients. Fortunately, because everyone keeps turning up, which is fantastic. So having a little look at who are they, and uh, so it's a bit number heavy, um, just to say that we've got plenty of patients with Parkinson's. And then this other group that we're looking at, um, as well as the REM um, sleep behaviour group, is the first degree relatives of people with Parkinson's, and then the people without Parkinson's who don't have a first degree relative. And as you can see, we're just picking up people who are very early from their diagnosis. So the average being within a year and a half of uh, being diagnosed with Parkinson's. So, this is a particularly busy slide, just to say the fact that we do appreciate it's a long afternoon, and before this we know that you spent one or two hours filling in the questionnaire beforehand. And this is because we are um, measuring such a wide variety of symptoms. I mean, as, as Michelle went to, this is one of the um, best characterised cohorts in the world, as well as one of the largest. 
And to this extent, we're looking through all these various domains <coughs> from things that affect people's cognition and mood to their gut symptoms to things that can affect the autonomic nervous system, so things like blood pressure control, heart rate variability, sensation, sleep problems, sexual dysfunction. So, how many people are affected by these symptoms? Lots. So, we can see here, this is the vast majority of people who are affected, and this little sliver here represents the people who don't have these problems. So, as you can see, it's a big problem. To give you a bit of an idea, this um, graph just shows the fact that people don't just have one or the other. It's, it's, not, it's not an exclusive thing. They will suffer more than one, two, and as you can see, many people suffer between five and ten different symptoms which are related. Now, it's a little bit tricky sometimes to just unpick, well, just because I've got Parkinson's, it doesn't protect me from all the other trials and tribulations of the world. Just because I've got Parkinson's, it doesn't protect me from arthritis. Arthritis can cause me pain. I mean, that's counted in here as well. People develop constipation. It doesn't necessarily have to be anything to do with Parkinson's. And so we also had a little look at unpicking, which is why it's so important that we do have the control cases to compare to. What we are seeing is the fact that people with Parkinson's do suffer these symptoms more as part of the disease process. <coughs> so, to give you an idea of what some of the most common things are, <coughs> I'd like to point out just here, so we've got hyposmia. So this is, this is loss of smell. But if you have a look here, if you have a look, pain is very common in Parkinson's. And it's not something that, again, that has really been picked out before. And so Michelle's actually started a collaboration with um, a researcher in Manchester, again funded by Parkinson's UK, having a look further into this very common and troubling symptom to see whether we can <coughs> get any further. But as I say, many of these symptoms are very common, affecting over half of people are things like urinary symptoms, people have problems with their sleep, constipation, fatigue. These are very common problems shared by a large number of people. So, as I mentioned, it does affect people the same age. And it's a slightly skewed graph, as you can see, loss of smell is much more common in Parkinson's compared to the controls. This graph is a little bit misleading, as you can't directly compare each of these symptoms. But each of these are much more common, more common than would be expected by chance in people with Parkinson's compared to people without Parkinson's. So people with Parkinson's would have up to 28 times more likely to have a loss of smell than somebody without Parkinson's. So this is a comparison, this is a relative measure. So they're much more likely to suffer um, loss of smell, um, particularly sort of pain, uh, sleep problems. So I hope I've made the case the fact that these are very common and worth looking at. And then I'd also like to say the fact that we are assessing people's quality of life, but how, how does this actually affect people? It's all very well saying they have these problems, but does it cause them problems? So just having a look, what we had a look at to see was how these NMS, so these are non-motor symptoms, how they affect the quality of life, and also these symptoms that I'm referring to, things like a lack of motivation, anxiety, depression, can actually impact on people's ability to do their day-to-day -day tasks, what we refer to as their activities of daily living, day-to-day -day functioning, chores, household cleaning, cooking, washing, dressing, this kind of thing, because that also can have an impact on people's quality of life. <coughs> and again, just having a look here, what we did is a comparison to see how much of an effect it was having on the quality of life. So again, this is a relative measure, all right? So we're saying that pain has a large impact on quality of life. So the further along this graph it is, the more impact, the worse the quality of life effect by each of these symptoms are. So as you can see, pain and depression came up particularly high. And just at the top here, what I'd like to draw your attention to is the fact that despite us spending all this time focusing on the motor aspects, sort of the tremor, the stiffness, the non-motor symptoms do actually have a bigger effect on quality of life. It affects people more than the motor symptoms. <coughs> and then also just referring to how the they also affect people's ability to manage their household chores, the activities of daily living. And again, we found that uh, motor scores and non-motor symptoms seem to have an equivalent impact. So, are they being treated? So we've mentioned the fact that they're very common. They cause people significant problems with their quality of life. But are we actually picking it up and treating it appropriately? And the answer is probably not as well as we could be. So we can have a look here. So the blue parts here are the people who are on treatment. 
and the red parts are the people who are suffering the symptom but are not on treatment. Now, again, just to point out the fact that we only looked at the medical treatment. So there are the other forms of, for example, treating depression, so cognitive behavioural therapy, counselling, but saying that this is probably not as high as we would hope. And again, looking at people with this REM sleep behaviour disorder, it may be that people don't want the treatment, but again, it's a very small number that are actually being treated. Although, admittedly, we do seem to be better with the constipation. <laughs> So, and then just, this is just a very brief slide to say that one of the groups we are looking at, and I, I, I'm not sure how many um, relatives there are here today, is the fact that we are doing these cross comparisons. So we do look at the people who have the Parkinson's compared to people who don't, and then also the people who have a first degree relative with Parkinson's. And actually, and again, this is a relative measure, this is based around what they would be if they um, did not have Parkinson's. And we can't actually predict yet whether the people with a first degree relative of Parkinson's are different to the people without Parkinson's population. So we can't actually use them perfectly as a control group. But we are looking at this, and it's really important that we keep following this group up to see whether any of them do go on to develop some of these symptoms so we can have that as that comparative group. So it's really important <coughs> in the follow-up study that we keep an eye on this group. And also, just briefly to say, we also mentioned about some of the uh, impact that looking at this work can have on the actual mechanisms underlying and driving what's causing Parkinson's disease. And this is work, as uh, Michelle mentioned, done by um, Yoav from Bristol. And just having a look at the different forms of Parkinson's and using this unbiased data-driven analysis to say, these are all the symptoms we have of Parkinson's. Are there different forms? And it's actually quite important that we picked out the non-motor symptoms as being hugely disc um, discrepant between the different groups. So you can see there's a different effect they have in different groups. So that can really help unpick the different forms of Parkinson's, which we can then go back to our basic scientists and say, right, OK, well, these groups are more similar, and we can have a look at the mechanisms beneath that. So in summary, Parkinson's is more than just a tremor. These symptoms that people are experiencing are very common. We're listening to you. They significantly impact on people's quality of life. We're possibly not treating them as well as we could be, and they may help unravel the underlying causes of Parkinson's and in the future lead to treatments. So it's really important. We're very grateful for people coming in and taking part in this study, and the ongoing follow-up of these, uh, well, of yourselves is very important and will also help uh, determine what happens in the future. I'd like to say thank you for everyone involved in the study and yourselves. Thank you.